Hi there. My name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. We've previously looked at signals that were sums of a finite number of sinusoids whose spectra consisted of distinct spectral lines. In this lecture, we'll introduce the discrete time Fourier transform, which will let us represent signals that contain a continuum of frequencies. In particular, the discrete time Fourier transform gives us a relationship between convolution in the time domain and simple multiplication in the Fourier transform domain. There are different kinds of Fourier transforms that all relate to one another in different ways. In the wild, if somebody says Fourier transform, they usually mean the continuous time Fourier transform, and you can learn about that from my EC 3084 lectures. But in this class, when we say Fourier transform, will usually mean the discrete time Fourier transform. Now, extremely confusingly, there is a variation called the discrete Fourier transform that's just called the DFT. It's related to the DTFT, but this all gets kind of complicated and we'll talk about that later. The DTFT maps a function of time x of n to a function of a frequency variable omega hat now, some textbooks will just write this as x omega hat. We'll use this alternate big X e to the j omega hat notation. The reason for this will become clear later when we talk about z transforms. But for now, just remember, this is a function of omega hat. Now, in general, if somebody gives you a transform, you want to ask what the inverse transform is. This lets us go from the Fourier transform domain back to the time domain. It involves an uncountable sum in the form of this integral. One thing to note is that this is an integral over a range of 2 pi, but a discrete time Fourier transform is periodic with period 2 pi, which you can see by plugging this in here. So any integral over a region of 2 pi will do. You could go from minus pi to pi. You could go from minus pi over 4 to 3 pi over 4, but usually one will be more convenient than another. Now, you might notice this looks an awful lot like the formula we use to find the frequency response of a filter from its impulse response. Indeed, if I let x be little h and big X be big H, this is that formula. The discrete time Fourier transform of an impulse response is the frequency response of that system, assuming big H exists. We'll talk about that in a second. The reason we use transforms is to make our life easier. Some questions are more elegantly addressed in one domain than another. One example of this general idea are the phasers that we looked at previously. They let us turn trigonometry into basic algebraic manipulation. One thing about using transforms is that you have to have an inverse transform. As I mentioned earlier, like frequency responses of discrete time systems, this more generalized discrete time Fourier transform is periodic in omega hat with a period of 2 pi. And you can see that by just plugging this in, splitting up the exponential, and realizing that because m and n here are both integers, this goes to 1. Now, big X doesn't actually exist for every little x in the universe. For big X to exist, a sufficient condition is that our sequence x be absolutely summable. So if you take its absolute value, add up all the values, you get something finite. So this is something I was a little sloppy about in some of the earlier lectures. I would make statements like, any linear time invariant system can be equivalently described by an impulse response or a frequency response. I should have added the caveat, assuming the frequency response exists. You always have an impulse response for an LTI system. But to have a frequency response, the impulse response needs to be absolutely summable. Now for the finite impulse response filters we looked at in most of our examples, that's definitely true. It's only when you have IIR filters that this becomes tricky. As a simple example, let's take the DTFT of a unit impulse. Plugging it into our function, delta of n only turns on at n equals 0. So, Plugging in 0 for n, that's the only term we have, e to the 0 equals 1. So the unit impulse has a transform that's just a constant 1 across all frequencies. Thus, we have our first discrete time Fourier transform pair. Now, this isn't surprising. We earlier saw that the frequency response 
of a system with an impulse response of a delta was just one. Now, instead of having a delta sitting at the origin, if I had a delta sitting at nd, we just have one term where we plug in nd for n. And if I look at the magnitude of that, well, that's still just one. But now the phase is this linear function of omega hat. It's minus omega hat nd. Here I'm using the term linear to describe the phase. Don't get that use of the term linear mixed up with the use of the term linear when we talk about a linear time invariant system. Now remember phase is ambiguous with multiples of 2 pi. So if you ask MATLAB to plot this for you, you might see it drop down here and go up here. You might see something like this here. Basically, vertically you'll typically have a plot ranging from minus pi to pi. So you'll get a plot modulo that. And it's not too hard to prove that this idea generalizes. If you have a signal little x of n, and you have its transform big X e to the j omega hat, you can figure out what the transform of a delayed version of x of n is by taking that transform big X and multiplying it by e to the minus j omega hat nd. So in this particular case, where x of n is delta of n, big X is just 1. So we get the same thing here as here. Let's look at this more complicated function that's a decaying exponential. So I have a to the n, and very importantly, I'm assuming that the magnitude of a is less than 1. Now, if I didn't have u in here, this would be expanding upward going this direction as well. But the u of n chops out everything for n less than 0. So plugging this into the discrete time Fourier transform formula, the unit step function can be accommodated by chopping off the sum at n equals 0. And then I can combine these exponentials into the sum of something to the n. Now, let's take this something and call it r. There's a convenient summation formula that we can use. So here we'll let a equal 0, r to the 0, well this all goes to 1. And b is infinity, so if we think about what r to the infinity plus 1 is, and very importantly, we know this is a number whose magnitude is less than 1, so we know that this is a number whose magnitude is less than 1. So this actually goes away. So in our particular case, we have a formula that's just 1 over 1 minus r. r is a e to the minus j omega hat. And again, this is all assuming that the magnitude of a is less than 1. Notice that a could be complex. There's nothing here that requires that a be real. But for the rest of the lecture, let's assume a is real. So we now have this Fourier transform pair. Big X is complex valued. To get a handle on it, we would like to plot the magnitude and the phase separately. So to get the magnitude, let's use a trick where we actually compute the magnitude squared by using this property of complex numbers that you can get the magnitude squared of a complex number by multiplying it by its complex conjugate. Now, complex conjugates are pretty nice operations in that they basically distribute over everything. So if you work this out, taking the complex conjugate of this just corresponds to flipping the sign in the exponent here. So we wind up with a plus here instead of a minus. So multiplying this out, I have 1 times 1, which gives us the 1 here. When I multiply this final term and this final term together, I wind up with an a squared, and then the e to the minus j omega hat and the e to the plus j omega hat cancel, and the minus signs cancel. And then as far as the cross terms go, I'll have a minus a that I can factor out, and then I have an e to the j omega hat plus an e to the minus j omega hat that I can rewrite as 2 cosine omega hat, using the inverse Euler's formula for cosine. As you might expect, the formula for the phase includes an arctangent function for converting from rectangular form to polar form. I'll leave the details of this as an exercise for the viewer. We'll say that the magnitude of x is an even function. It's symmetric in omega hat. And we'll say that the phase of x is an odd function. It has the symmetry, but there's a negative sign here. So this plot has mirror symmetry on the vertical axis, and this plot has mirror symmetry along both the vertical and horizontal axes. Now this business about this being even and this being odd, that's not just true for this particular example. 
That's true for any example in which x is real valued. Here's a couple of examples of magnitude functions along with their associated phase functions. The solid line corresponds to a larger a, and the dashed line corresponds to a smaller a. A larger a will correspond to a slowly decaying function. A smaller a will correspond to a quickly decaying function. Notice that as a gets smaller and smaller, x of n more and more resembles the unit impulse. So it makes sense that the magnitude here gets flatter and flatter as a gets smaller. Notice that if we could construct a filter with this impulse response, the resulting frequency response would be considered a low-pass filter. We'll look at such things later when we talk about IIR filters. Now, what if we needed to go the other direction? If we were to take this big X and plug it directly into this integral, this integral would be very hard to do. Our general approach to avoid difficult integrals is to use a table of Fourier transform pairs that we've already derived, along with a set of properties we'll talk about in a future lecture, to be able to do the inverse transform. Now, this issue goes the other direction. There are some transform pairs we're going to look at that are actually easier to derive, starting from the Fourier domain and then using this integral to go back to the time domain. And if you directly try to use the Fourier transform integral to go from the time domain to the frequency domain, it's a lot harder. So we'll generally go with whatever path is easiest. Now, in this particular case, we need to be careful because we see a plus sign here but there's a minus sign here in front of the a in the table. So a is actually minus 0.3. So the magnitude of the signal is decaying, but if we plot the function, it actually goes up, down, up, down, up, down, switching positive, negative, positive, negative. I want to make a few more comments before we close out. If you look at the 1 over 2 pi factor here, this normalization factor, it's a matter of a convention that we put it there. One could create a DTFT pair where you don't have the 1 over 2 pi here, but you put the 1 over 2 pi here. That would be just a different version. Or you could do something where you put, say, 1 over square root of 2 here and 1 over square root of 2 here. That would be a working transform pair. I don't think anybody does that, though. I think for the DTFT, everyone puts the 1 over 2 pi here. Actually, maybe somebody watching this video has seen one of these alternative normalizations. If you've seen a textbook or a paper, use some convention other than putting the 1 over 2 pi here, leave a comment below. My last comment is a bit more philosophical. I don't want to give you the impression that the DTFT is the important formula and this inverse formula is just something we need that hangs out. From a certain point of view, this formula here is actually the bigger deal. It's telling you that you can write any discrete time function as a sum over a continuum of complex sinusoids with that sum over that continuum being manifest by this integral. That's really remarkable. And if you think about this formula here as the important one, well, this is just a formula that we use to be able to slice and dice a time domain function to figure out what the weights on those complex sinusoids are.